Well, it's Saturday, May 19th, 2018, and um, I'm heading south on State Highway 47 in Oregon towards McMinnville. I'm on the way to the Evergreen Aviation Museum or whatever its current version of its name is, Air and Space Museum, I suppose. I've got other, another YouTube video on visiting this museum, but it's oriented towards the Spruce Goose aircraft specifically. And um, since I'm in the area again and have a little bit of time, after vin uh, visiting the Vintage Tech Museum in Beaverton, I thought I would go down and do a museum walkthrough of the Evergreen Museum. And not focus on any one particular aircraft. I decided to take what I would consider to be the more scenic route heading out from the Beaverton area on Highway 8 and then taking Highway 47 south. on Highway 99W. Northeast Cumulus Avenue. And here we are at the Evergreen. In one half mile, arrive at 500 Northeast Cap Michael King Smithway on the left. The, what's basically the Evergreen Museum campus. It has at least a couple of museums here. The Evergreen Aviation and Space Museum is the, the main one we're going to today. Wings and Waves Water Park here, which we're not going to go to. There's also kind of an IMAX theater 
which we won't go to, but I'll do the walk around to the Air Museum Arriving and the Space at Museum. 500 Northeast Cap Michael King Smithway on the left. So the Space Museum is over in that building, and this is the Evergreen Theater, and over here is the original building. It was the only one here for a while. This is the Air Museum, it's built specially to house the Spruce Goose, but with plenty of room for other airplanes. get to enter the museum through a large jet engine intake. And of course, the centerpiece of the museum is the Spruce Goose, which I've covered on another video on YouTube. Since I was here last, they've added quite a few airplanes. Um, after the troubles of the Evergreen Corporation, that was a major contributor to this museum, um, after their business problems, a number of the planes that were on loan here um, were taken out by whoever owned them. And some aircraft that were owned by the museum, I believe, uh, were sold or ones that were maybe not owned by the museum, but they were owned by Evergreen, separate from the museum, but stationed here at this museum, were pulled out um, to satisfy creditors or whoever. So for a while they were pretty sparse on aircraft, but it looks like they've made quite the effort to get substitute airplanes in here. So it is a fully populated collection. So, go down this engine row. This is a right whirlwind engine. A Koyuna UL 2 02 engine. A Lycoming O 235 C1. De Havilland Gypsy Queen 70 Mark II. Pratt & Wispy, Pratt & Whitney Wasp Jr. R985-AN-14B. And a Franklin Model 6A8-215. This is a Wright R2600. And this is a uh, mock-up based on the sketches of Leonardo da Vinci for an ornithopter design that he'd sketched up.
And this is a uh, copy of a Curtis Pusher from 1909. The replica was made in 1990. Curtis, of course, came after the Wright brothers, but not long after. And although the planes bear a lot of resemblance to each other, in many ways he was more advanced. He'd, while the Wright brothers were hung up on their patents uh, and not moving much beyond that, Curtis saw the improvements they'd made and uh, also the improvements that could be made that the brothers were too stubborn to implement on their own. So um, his really were the better performing airplanes that point uh, instead of wing warping for example he would use the ailerons you can see sort of tacked on there but still it was a big improvement <clears throat> and this is a uh, replica of a Wright 1903 flyer which of course is uh, the one that's famous from the old picture. This replica was built uh, between July 2000 and April 2001. Built from the plans that were on file at the Smithsonian. Various early aviation test equipment, wind tunnels and so on. This uh, airplane here <clears throat> is a JN-4. And this is a Curtis OX-5 engine. This is a Larone C9J engine. And over here is a Sopwith Camel F1. It's a replica. It has never been flown. So. They have this nice uh, sort of diorama type exhibit showing the Hughes Aircraft Factory where the Spruce Goose was constructed. Very nicely done. And this is a replica of the Ryan NYP, better known as the Spirit of St. Louis, from 1927. This is the one and only example of its type, a British DH-4 bomber and reconnaissance aircraft from World War I.
and this is a Curtis Robin from 1928. This is a Thorpe T-18 Tiger, part of the first generation of all-metal home-built aircraft. And this is a Landcare 360 home-built aircraft from roughly 1988. And this is a uh, home-built aircraft called the Quickie Q2. And this is a Grumman JRF-5 Goose from 1937. Very popular amphibious aircraft. Nice model of a constellation, but not a super constellation, the original constellation. And sitting right overhead is the uh, wing float from a PBY. One thing I always thought was pretty cool about this model of aircraft is that the wing floats would swing up into that recess in the bottom of the wing so that the float actually made like a pontoon shaped bulge at the end of the wing so it was much more aerodynamic than uh, other designs including the spruce goose where the float always just hung down there This aircraft is really about the same size as a B-17, although very different purpose. Yeah, you tell it was, the world. was built by Consolidated, and its full designator is the PBY-5A, and its nickname is the Catalina. Maritime Patrol, Rescue, and other functions. And this is the landing gear from a Boeing 707. There doesn't seem to be a sign for this, but obviously it's a very small 
Caterpillar tractor. It's sitting out here under the wing of the Catalina is another float plane. And this is a uh, Super Cat Simulator demo. Up overhead here is a Beach Model 35 Bonanza. And this uh, guy hanging out under the Catalina wing is a Republic S, I'm sorry, RC-3CB. And this little guy is a Glass Air SH-2RG home-built aircraft. This is a Learjet, model 24, from 1963. Luxury, but only just. Very exclusive, of course, but hardly any room in it. I don't know what you had to do in here if you needed to use the toilet. And as far as the pilots were concerned, you had about as much room as in a little Cessna. Couldn't stand up inside here, you'd have to hunch over all the time. But still... And this ugly guy here with the large nose is a modified Rockwell Saberliner 50 from 1958. And it has this extra ray dome fitted for testing the airliner radar systems, or for testing radar systems for airliners. And up here is a Yakovlev Yak-50. And of course, here is a Douglas DC-3, an A model. No signage on this one, and I forget what type it is. This little one is a uh, old field baby Great Lakes from 1997. And this is, of course, a North American F 86H Saber. And this is a North American FJ-3 Fury. Closely related aircraft. And this is a Republic F-84F Thunderstreak. This is a de Havilland DH-100 Vampire FB-9 from 1966.
This is a Granville Brothers E-Model Sportster replica from 1950 or 1995 is when it was built. <clears throat> and this is a Cassette Cassett 3M Formula One racer from 1954. This is a Boeing Stearman military trainer aircraft. It's pretty much universally called the Stearman, but I think people forget that it's a Boeing product. And there's no signage on this one. This appears to be an example of a Pitts special when asked about retirement from uh, 1944 I sport aerobatic aircraft. That's the uh, Handley Raven. It's a one-of-a-kind show plane. This is a Vans Aircraft RV-6. This is a Pete and Paul Air Camper from 1937. This is a Fock Wolf FW190A-7 Verger, but it's a replica. But the type dates from 1939. This is a Messerschmitt BF109 G10 Gustav from 1944. This is a Supermarine Spitfire Mark 6 from 1945. Looks like somebody got married recently. This is a Douglas A26C Invader from 1944. And this is a Curtis Wright A22, otherwise known as a CW A22 Falcon from 1938. And there's some various things back there that are not completely assembled or newly arrived or soon to depart or something. Future restoration projects. This is a 1943 Piper L4H 
U.S. Army liaison aircraft, also known as the Grasshopper. This is a Messerschmitt ME 262 A1 Schwalbe from 1942. And we've been around this way. And this is an Auster AOP Mark VI from 1945. Originally is a Taylor Craft product. This is a Beechcraft T-34 Mentor from 1948. Sitting here outside is an LTV A7 Corsair II. That's Ling Temco Vought is LTV. This is a Douglas AD-5N Sky Raider. And this is a um, North American product. It's the NA6, I'm sorry, the um, SNJ-4, otherwise known as the Texan. This is another training aircraft, the Fairchild PT-19 from 1939. And this is a Ryan PT-22 recruit from 1933. And outside is a Convair F-102A Delta Dagger. And this plane that's parked outside is a Douglas AD-5N Sky Raider. Notice that all the benches for people to rest in are business class seats taken out of airliners. You can tell they're business class because of the extra wide armrests. 
if not the width of the seats themselves, which typically aren't that much wider than regular coach, but you've got more elbow room. So I think we've covered pretty much all the aircraft that are in the Air Museum. There's a few more hanging up on the ceiling, but I did not see any informational cards about them. Got a small helicopter set up there as an agricultural sprayer. And this is the, uh, was it Bell that made this? Uh, this is the kind that was used for aerial evacuation, medical evacuation, in the Korean War, as shown in the MASH TV and movie, or TV show and movie. And a glider, but I don't see a sign saying what kind it is. And there's an inverted uh, aerobatic plane, but if there was a sign, I didn't see it. Since we're here, oh, I missed a couple over here. This is a Bell UH-1H Iroquois, otherwise known as the Huey. Very iconic helicopter. And this is a Cessna 02 Skymaster, also known as the Oscar Deuce from the 02. And it says this particular example, this exact example of the craft is the one used during the recovery of Lieutenant Colonel ICO Gene Hambleton, which was portrayed in the 1988 movie Bat 21 with Gene Hackman and Danny Glover which is actually quite a good movie. So this is the one that was really used for the real adventure. And here's a Staunton bus from 1920 to 1930 period. And even though I have a tour of the Spruce Goose on my other video, I'm going to step in and just give the quick look, not the view you can see from one of the paid tours. Very cool. Very happy about that. And over here we've got a Beach D-17A Traveler from 1939. And this is a Curtis Model 51 Fledgling from 1929. And this is a, uh, did I get this one already? Curtis Robin? Maybe I did. It's hard to keep track walking in circles. So, time to go over to the Space Museum.
So there's another DC-3 type aircraft over there. I imagine that's uh, listed as a C-47. And this aircraft outside in the front is a 1970 Northrop F-5E Tiger II. This is a Grumman TF-9J Cougar from 1956. And this is a MiG-29, known to NATO as the Fulcrum A. You have to watch it out here, there's just tons of like prairie dog holes or something. Tricky to walk out here. You can make out the goose inside there. This is a Grumman F 14D Super Tomcat. This is a Convair F-106A Delta Dart. And we've already seen this guy through the glass from the inside. Part of the museum complex is the water park and water slide. Uh, you can take an elevator up into the 747 up there and go out the emergency escapes and those are the beginnings of the curly water slides back down into the the pool inside never been in there but uh, I think people could have a lot of fun there if they've got the time and the gatekeeper of the museum complex is another 747 from Evergreen International. I'm not sure if that company still exists, but uh, at one point they were pretty influential and they have another building across the way which is not part of the museum, but it's done in the same style as all the museum buildings, which I think is one of the more attractive designs of any aircraft museum I've ever seen. They've got that nice north woodsy design, kind of like a big lodge, but there's still like an aircraft hangar. They're very practical and attractive, I think. Kudos to whoever picked the architect that designed those. And, of course, the architect. And positioned out in front of the theater building is a Douglas uh, A4E Skyhawk. And this is a Rockwell T2C Buckeye from 1970. And now we see over here the Space Museum. I think it's roughly the same building size as the Air Museum. We're going to walk around and catch these other outdoor aircraft before going in.
This is a Lockheed T-33A Shooting Star from 1948. And this is a DC-9 type aircraft. And from the markings, it's one of those that was designated for executive level U.S. government transport. And let's see what its sign says. Always loved the DC-9. Beautiful airplane. So yeah, it's a McDonnell Douglas VC-9C version of the DC-3 from 1965. VIP and trans tra <laughs> VIP and passenger transport. There we go. This one was fitted with the VIP interior, secure satellite communications. Uh, in-flight TV and telecommunication, telecommunications computers to transport U.S. government officials, including the Vice President, Secretary of State, First Lady, diplomats, and other high-profile passengers. When carrying the Vice President, it received the call sign Air Force Two. They have a serious bird crap problem here. This is a Republic F-105G Thunder Chief from uh, 1955, I believe. The number is covered with bird poop, but pretty sure that's when it came out. This is a Lockheed F-94C Starfire from 1949. So I have uh, all of 50 minutes left before they're going to close the doors. I better get busy and get inside here. collection here is supposedly rather volatile. A lot of artifacts are on loan from other museums and collections. So it's worth coming here fairly often because the collection changes. There's a V1 buzz bomb up there. And it was recommended that I go up on the balcony or mezzanine. This is a uh, V1. This is a uh, redstone type rocket, the military version. <clears throat> and this, of course, is a Titan. I'm not sure offhand whether it's a Titan one. It is a Titan II. 
I have a separate YouTube video from the Titan II Missile Museum in Arizona if you want to watch that. But they have a Titan II in their missile silo. Deactivated, of course, but still a Titan II. Supposed to be one of the Navy helicopters hauling an Apollo capsule out of the ocean after a successful landing. And there's an instrumentation unit from a Saturn V, I believe that's what it is. And a mock-up of a lunar landing module, LEM anyway. Now let's get these helicopters viewed first. This is a Sikorsky UH-34D Seahorse. And this is a Sikorsky H-19A Chickasaw. And this is a Cayman SH-2F Sea Sprite. This is a McCulloch J-2 Gyrocopter with the rotors off. And this little guy is a Benson B-8M Gyrocopter. This is a Hiller YH-32 Hornet from 1950. And this is a Hiller XROE-1 Rotorcycle from 1957. A single-person craft observation helicopter. This is a Sikorsky HO3S1G from 1946. This is a Hiller OH23B Raven from 1948. This is a Delacner DH4 Helivector from 1954, where the pilot actually stood on top of the blades. Had to be a little bit unnerving. This is a Hughes Model 269A Osage. And a Piasecki H21C Shawnee. and a Hiller 1031 flying platform. This is a replica from 1955.
Well, I think it's a bell something or another, but there seems to be no signage for it. <clears throat> and delivered to Eglin Air Force Base in Florida. This is a Bell HTL-3 from 1950. Of course, this is a Bell AH-1F Cobra, 1965. And Northrop Grumman RQ A-8 Fire Scout from 2000, unmanned. And I, this is a Boeing A-160 Hummingbird, first flew in 2004. This is also a rotorcraft, but no rotors visible on here. And neither of these Bell products are identified by signage. All right, let's move over to here. There's some more aircraft in the Space Museum. This is a Lockheed 104G Starfighter. And of course this museum has an SR-71. And this is the only museum display of an SR-71 that I've seen where the uh, housing on the engine is opened up and you can see the engine. or at least part of it. The SR-71 flew its first combat mission on March 21, 1968, from Kahina Air Base on the island of Okinawa. The mission? Overflight of North Vietnam. At the SR-71 speed, that would only take eight minutes to fly. However, a mission usually would fly the mission. Most of the time, it's a there is no engine installed on this side, just an empty duct. <coughs> this is one of the start carts. We saw another one of these a few days ago in the Los Angeles area in another video I did there. An ejection seat, type C3, built by Glenn Martin. And this is one of the little drones that could be carried on the back of a SR-71. The GTD-21B drone. carried on the back like that. Not sure what that is up there. I don't see a sign for it.
And uh, up overhead is an X-15 North American Aviation. But no good vantage points to really see it from unless you work in one of the offices up there. And another helicopter on a trailer. No ID on that. So what's this guy? No signage on it that I can see. Oh, there's something on the intake. This is a McDonnell F-101 Voodoo from 1954. This is a McDonnell Douglas F-4C Phantom II. This is a Pratt & Whitney J48 jet engine. This big guy is a Pratt & Whitney JT9D7A turbofan, the kind used on 747s. This is a JT3D turbofan by Pratt & Whitney. Looks like it was probably used on commercial transports, but I don't know offhand which models. And this guy here does not have any signage that I can see identifying it. This looks like a laid down Titan here. <clears throat> yep, the dual nozzle single first stage engine. Always a point of confusion with the Titans. They only had one first stage engine, but it had a double ignition chamber. Some people might argue that makes it into two engines, but apparently it's considered to be one engine. So you got your first stage here. And then the second stage. A similar engine, but it's only got one bell. One ignition chamber and one bell. And the mock-up of the lunar module and entire LEM assembly, actually. The mock-up of the lunar rover. Various bits and pieces. I would say this is a... Uh, is this from an atlas? No, this is an Ullage engine from the third stage of the Saturn V. Which just look like tiny little bumps on the side of the rocket. But these are what are used to give a boost to a stage that's about to ignite after separation from the stage below. And it gives just a slight forward boost to the stage it's attached to which causes the uh, fuel to move towards the bottom of the fuel tank so that when they do light the engines, the main engines on that stage, that there's fuel there to be ignited.
This is the J2 engine, which was used on the second and third stages of the Saturn V. Unlike the first stage, which used kerosene burning engines, the F5 engine, the J2 engine burns hydrogen and oxygen. This is a Lunacod, a Russian lander. I'm not sure if this is a real one or a mock-up. Maybe it'll tell me. Unmanned Soviet spacecraft named Luna 7 landed on the moon. It carried a neat, unique cargo, an eight-wheeled tub-shaped lunar rover called the Lunacod, meaning moonwalker. This is a replica of the Lunacod. This is a fuel injector from an M1 engine. This points out that the F1 engines used on the Saturn V were powerful, but they weren't the mightiest ever developed in the U.S. That distinction went to the M1 engine, which was a liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen propelled monster. Um, that was rated up to two million pounds thrust. It was America's most ambitious rocket engine. Plan was that the M1 would take over from Saturn's engine to power upcoming manned deep space explorations. But by the mid 1960s, it became clear there would be no funding for such missions. So after having been built and tested, the M1 faded into history. This is an actual M1 engine. Well, it's not the engine, it's just the bell. And maybe not even the whole bell. It looks like there should be more of it. I suspect there was. This is, I think, a piece of an engine bell from an M1, not the entire engine. That would be up there somewhere. <clears throat> I think I may have to mention that to them. I think it's important to not show just a piece of something and identify it as the whole thing. This is a transition chamber from Skylab, which li linked the living and working quarters of the space station to its docking adapter. And what is this? Um, some sort of mobile control station or fueling station for a Titan IV vehicle. This is the instrumentation unit from a Saturn V. The guidance equipment and instrumentation and all sorts of other things were all bolted around the inside of this ring, which was just stuck in between a couple of the stages, and it provided control for the rocket during launch. It's clear that most of the modules that would normally be bolted up here have been removed. The cables are just hanging there, and you can see where something was bolted up. <clears throat> As I recall, this was developed by IBM. And you see all those pictures of big cable assemblies being suddenly unplugged from the side of the rocket just as it began launching, and I presume this is one of those portals. <clears throat> Pratt and, Whitney, Pratt and Whitney J57 turbojet. This is the kind that was used on the B-52 and the Convair F-102 Delta Dagger and the F-4D Sky Ray and a bunch of other planes. This is an H1 engine from the first stage of the Saturn 1B, which used eight of these engines. This is not to be confused with the Saturn V. The 
Saturn 1B was a smaller rocket that was used when they did not have to be going to the moon or lofting a lunar module. This is an RL-10 engine. Um, what was it used for? It does not say. It's on loan from the Smithsonian. Appears to be a replica of Ed White's Gemini 4 with a replica, replica of Ed White doing his first spacewalk. And this is uh, Titan 1 equipment here. This is the uh, kerosene and liquid oxygen fueled engine from a Titan 1 first stage. Looks a lot like the one from the Titan 2. But that one used hypergolic fuels and did not use kerosene and liquid oxygen. That was one of the issues with the Titan I was it took time to be fueled before it could be flown. And with the cryogenic fuel, it could not be stored, so you had to have a long delay after launch order before it could be fueled and ready to fly. And the Titan II used hypergolic fuels, which could be stored for quite a long time and it was ready to fly in seconds. Of course it brought with it a lot of complexity because of the corrosive nature of the fuel and the high level of toxicity and the fact that if the fuels were to get combined due to a leak it would blow up instantly. So much more volatile but this is a engine I believe used on a Atlas rocket. This I think is the sustainer engine, the middle of the three engines. And this, uh, we already saw the Titan II that's standing up there. And old reliable here, the uh, military Redstone rocket. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. This rocket was developed by the team of German rocket scientists and other American scientists as a ICBM type of device, but it was then made man ready and launched the first manned. Uh, space voyages uh, from Alan Shepard and Gus Grissom and so on. Then they switched over with the um, Atlas rocket for the Mercury Atlas missions, which were orbital missions. And I believe it was John Glenn's flight that was the first one to fly on the Atlas in the Mercury program. This is an R7 engine. Um, again, one engine with multiple nozzles. And this was used, um, it has been used on all sorts of Soviet rockets. Extremely reliable engine. Modern versions of this continue to ferry passengers and payloads into space. More than 1,700 of these have been launched, over 97% successfully.
This is a uh, sort of a cosmetic copy of Robert Goddard's first uh, rocket. The V1 again. And this is the uh, V2. Presumably one of the ones built in the U.S. after the war. Or is this a mock-up? Kind of looks like it's a mock-up. I'm not sure this is a real one. I don't see that it says, but there's little details about it that don't look real. It could be a mock-up. Some of the skin fits together kind of poorly. So I'm guessing this is not a real one. Appears to be an X-38 lifting body. It's supposed to be lifted into space in the cargo bay of a space shuttle, but it was canceled due to a budget crunch. This is a MiG-21 Fishbed J from 1975. This is a MiG 17A called the Fresco from 1953. And I did not see signage for that. I think that's one of the Northrop machines. Aerial targets. This is a McDonald KDD1 Katie did. And a uh, USMC Mastiff 3 unmanned aerial vehicle. And this is a McDonnell Douglas F-15A Eagle from 1977. And this is a MiG-23 known to NATO as the Flogger. And hanging up overhead is a Northrop Grumman RQ-4A Global Hawk from 1998. Unmanned vehicle. Fairly large one. And this is an in-situ A-20 InSight unmanned reconnaissance vehicle. And I think I've covered just about everything here. It's a good thing, because there's just a few minutes left. 
let's check this one out here. I think I missed this. Soviet craft. This is a replica of the Vega spacecraft, the Soviet Vega project, launched in December of 1984, consisted of two identical unmanned spacecraft, Vega 1 and Vega 2, with two identical double missions. Each made a study of the atmosphere, clouds, and surface of Venus in 1985, and then rendezvoused with Halley's Comet in 1986. Vega is a contraction of the Russian words for Venus and Halley. First, as the spacecraft neared Venus, they launched landing capsules towards the cloud-covered planet. As they descended, the capsules released balloon probes that floated above the planet's surface for days, collecting and transmitting data. Then, using Venus's gravity as slingshots, the spacecraft hurtled on towards Halley, eventually passing within 5,000 miles of the comet. The images and information gathered helped later spacecraft to investigate the comet even more intimately. And this is a replica, as previously mentioned. I think I already mentioned the uh, <clears throat> Gemini spacecraft up there. Yeah, it was the one, a uh, copy of the one that Ed White flew on. And I think that's it. And I don't think there's any escape over on this side. I think we have to go around. Yep. So sort of a hodgepodge over here, but still very interesting stuff. Northeast three mile lane. And there's at least two buildings on this side that are <coughs> similar in architectural design to the museums. airport over here. It's big enough to land things like 747s in. It's just the McMinnville Municipal Airport. I'm not sure if that's what it was always called. I thought it was called Evergreen Airport or something, but maybe the name changed after the company's financial issues. Anyway, I didn't mention where this museum is. It's kind of out in the middle of nowhere, sort of. Um, if you're driving up the coast of the U.S., which is a popular tourist thing to do, um, McMinnville's not that far inland. Um, you'd grab something that would take you over to Highway 18. I think actually 18 goes all the way to the coast highway and take it up towards Portland partway. Or if you're in the Portland area, you can take uh, Highway 
28 um, southwest from Portland out towards the Pacific Coast and there's McMinnville right smack dab in the middle. Um, actually it's Highway 18 that I say 28. Anyway, it's Highway 18. Ignore anything about 28. Just out in the uh, countryside here. Of course, I misspoke just back there. It's not Highway 18 that goes all the way into Portland. Highway 18 runs into Highway 99W and merges with it, and that one runs in towards Portland. So, clearing up my small error I made earlier. I hope you enjoyed this uh, walkthrough of the Evergreen Aviation Museum.